Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Today we are in the Smoky Mountains at a visitor center that opened in 2011. This is a 3.5 million dollar project and endeavor that was taken on by the Smoky Mountain Association to bring us something really cool to go check out today. So it's a busy day. We have our mask. Let's go inside. Darn guys, the museum is actually closed right now because of the traffic that's coming through. Now, just to kind of give you a heads up, Saturday, um, I was searching for parking for about 15 minutes before I could find a parking spot. That's how crowded it gets. It gets a little nuts here on weekends when everybody's off, especially since it's the fall season, people are wanting to come through to look at the leaves. So, we're gonna do some more of the outside stuff instead. The gift shop here though is really nice. Okay, even though the museum portion is closed, there are some exhibits right here that we can actually check out that show us a little bit more about the park. And specifically, I wanna look at this one right here and this one right here, which are two locations that I really want to go to on this trip. Mingus Mill is very close to where we actually are right now. And right here we can find a little fact about it. 1886, wow. And then this is where I'm hoping we could go. Now I did just talk to a ranger and he said that we would be able to get down there in the van. So this is gonna be a nice scenic day while we're in the Smokies. The first thing that we notice when we enter the visitor center is this model right here which gives us a layout of what the Smoky Mountain National Park actually looks like. And then some of the facts about the mileage from this particular visitor center, different destinations that we might be interested in, and then also how the Smokies got their name. Now, something to note right here is that distance is a little bit deceiving. So if you see something's 30 miles, it's going to take more than 30 to 35 minutes. There's a lot of twisty, turny, windy roads, so it makes driving a lot more difficult in the mountains. Then add in the visitors that are actually in the park at any given time, and it can be quite congested. In addition, there is this, which actually helps you to kind of plan your trip. If you're wanting to take a hike, it gives you some recommendations. And if you're wanting to do an auto tour, it gives you a few recommendations as well. And let's see what we have. Cade's Cove Loop, the Roaring Fork, which is something I really want to do. And then the Newfoundland Gap and Clingman Dome. Okay, so we did speak to a ranger though, and they did tell us a little bit about what was inside the museum itself. It's not gonna be open for a while because of COVID. So what they did say was the cleaning schedule was actually degrading the things that were inside of it because there's artifacts in there and that's really toxic to the sensitive materials that are the artifacts. So that's why it's not open. It's not because it's just like super crowded or anything and there's too many touch surfaces. This is one of those things that for the preservation, they have to close. Uh, they said also that they've been seeing an abnormally large amount of traffic through the park for this time of year. Normally this is a much slower time of year but because there are more people who don't have to be tied to one location because either they're not working currently or their kids don't have to be enrolled in school and can learn digitally from anywhere, they're seeing a lot more people that are here during random days of the week as well as weekends. So it's going to be a pretty crazy little walk around probably anywhere that we go in the park over the next few weeks. We are going to take the Mountain Farm Museum Trail right this way. Thank you. 
Okay guys, we have arrived at the Mountain Farm Museum and as you can see, lots of other people are out here enjoying themselves today. It is a beautiful day. And as we arrive, we find this first piece right here. This is gonna tell us a little bit more about the Mountain Farm and what we can expect. Now, something to note is that the buildings that are on the property were actually brought here from other locations. This one right here came from Deep Creek, North Carolina, which isn't too far away. But we get to learn about the family that actually lived in this home and why it's important. They also have right here a little booklet that you can purchase for a dollar that's going to tell you more about each one of the structures as you walk around. So I encourage you guys to pick that up if you're interested in finding out a few extra details. Now, something else I recommend you guys downloading before you come out to the park is the tours for National Park Service parks and historic sites. Some of the Smoky Mountain stops are actually on this app and it'll tell you more about them as you go, which is pretty cool. Some of them actually have an audio tour that's attached to it. As we come out to the woodshed, it looks like they have an ash hopper and this would have been used for making lye soap. And if you've never tried lye soap, it is a once in a lifetime experience, I'll tell you. The woodshed is fully stocked right now and they do actually stock this up and use it in the visitor center. So this is some of the downed lumber that they found throughout the park and they bring it here and turn it into ricks of firewood. This building here is the meat house and this would have been one of the most protected and valuable commodities within the mountain farm. This protected all of their food for the family, not only during the cooler months, but also during the warmer months. And they would rely so heavily on this building right here. Now keep in mind, like a lot of the places that we have gone and learned about communities that were around this time, if you needed it, you had to get it for yourself make it, preserve it, do everything. So for the meat house, they would have either had to have hunted or raised whatever it was, then butchered it and then preserved it. And because of this, pork was a big deal because it preserved much easier than most of the other things. Now this fence here might not look like it's supposed to be here. And you are absolutely right. This is not at all in the time period of what we're looking at. This is a modern fence and it was actually put into place to protect these trees. <laughs> now why? Because they have a group of elk that settle in here daily and they try to ravage these trees. So they are trying to preserve them. Kind of related to the orchard, which is right here, we have this sign for the apple house now the apple house was exactly what you think it would be it would be where the apples were stored and preserved and created different kinds of things from such as apple sauces and apple vinegars and apple ciders and things like that so this building would have been extremely important just like the meat house now something that's kind of different around here right now is you can't get into the buildings and you know I, I kind of get it like a lot of things are just closed right now typically you would be able to walk inside some of these to kind of get a spatial awareness of how much space would have been there and some of them do have a few things in them but um not the case right now so instead we're moving on to an outdoor space that we know we can get into and what is this what what we are looking at is what they would have done with sorghum cane. And here they would heat it with a fire on this end that would go all the way back and then would pipe out through this stove in the back. Now sorghum was something else that was very commonplace in this area and they would actually grind it down using pack animals and grinders. And this right here is what that apparatus might have looked like. So the sorghum cane would be this rough, tough stuff and they'd push it between here. It would break it down. And this top little bit, I believe, would have an attachment to it 
that would be turned by usually a mule or a horse. Okay guys, we have a few more buildings out here to go to, so I am really excited to see what these are. Now, a lot of the buildings themselves look very similar in stature because that's how they were created. They use this little tail system where it was like notched out on the ends just like this, and that's what would make it a little bit more sturdy and also have less spacing in between the logs. So it's cool to see how many different versions of this they have out here from different buildings. This one is the corn crib, and it's just what it sounds like. It was the place that they put the corn. So, so far we've seen the apple house, the meat house, and the corn crib. Now, the corn crib was a little different in the way that it was set up because, well, it had a floor so that the things wouldn't sit out and then rot. Some of the other buildings didn't have a floor. They had just like a dirt floor, but this one, they'd pile it high and they needed a floor so most of the corn cribs you'll find have floors wooden ones but still floors and this is what it looks like inside here guys so you'll see that the corn would have been gathered up in the back there and then this building would have had a roof but it would have been just like a wooden roof but it would have protected the crops so that they could use it and grind it down to make a meal or use it as regular corn they could also use it as feed, things like that. Speaking of large barns, this guy is pretty vast. You'll see over here we have a carriage and then some other equipment. It's huge. You could definitely put a lot of stuff in here, but let's go find out how they used this particular barn and if it tells us where it came from. Okay, these look like they might have been sleds at one point especially this one that has the little portion which goes upward and this could have been used for a variety of different things i'm sure especially considering they're in the smokies where it does snow here in here we have an assortment of different plows and equipment that you would use with the plow so i can only assume that one of these other doors probably would have been for some livestock possibly livestock that they would have used in conjunction with a plow like this one right here, you can see that it has the slatted door frame, which would have been breathable for the animals. And then inside it has what looks like a little trough area. And then a area down here also that would have kept the hay. So this definitely would have been an animal pen area. Additional storage back here, currently being used for lumber, but might have been used for that also whenever this was a functional barn. And then more hay here. But that's not the only place that I saw that they also had some hay. Up top they actually have a functional platform which they obviously have a few things over here which could have been functional but they had some hay at the end as well. A lot of times these larger loft areas would be used for a hay loft so that they could have plenty to get them through the winter months. Okay, side note from our exciting adventure that we're going on right now. This little sign you can find throughout the entire park. It says Bob was here. What this means is that Bob decided to sign his name into a log. And well, that is illegal. That is a huge offense and you can actually be fined. So if you're at home and you're watching this video and you happen to be thinking, oh my gosh, that would be a cool place to leave my Instagram handle. Don't do that. Just don't do that. There have actually been several influencers in other countries as well as this country who have decided that was a good idea. And what it does is it actually destroys something that is historic or that is natural. Those things can't be brought back, so don't do that. And uh, read the signs, they're important. Now this right here would have been a hog pen, and despite the fact that this is a pen that you would think that they would pin up their hogs all the time, most of the time they didn't. This was only really used during the fall months. During the rest of the year, a lot of times, because hogs could be self-sufficient, they would actually allow them to run in the neighboring forested area. Of course, most of those forested areas were fenced off, so they couldn't go anywhere too crazy. But what they would do is they would allow them to repopulate, and then they would have an unlimited supply of food. And anything that was surplus, they could also sell off. Okay, so we're taking a little break from the regular path and we're coming down here to the water it's absolutely beautiful 
and with the recent rains the water is definitely moving I can only imagine that this would be probably one of the most peaceful places ever to just sit and listen <sighs> it's also probably the reason why the elk come here every day they can drink and then they can bed down for the night in the neighboring field and they have an unlimited supply of food in the area it's a great place to be look at this look at this Now, as you can see, this is quite the way to spend a considerable amount of time. And there are trails all along the shoreline over here. So you can walk down for quite a ways to get a vantage point of the different sets of rapids and the gorgeous surrounding trees and hear the birds and see the little butterflies. There's even a man who's wading out in the water in his waders trying to catch some fish. There's so many activities that you can do right here, just at this one stop. And this is one of many here in the Smoky Mountains. This is just the first stop as you come into the park and there's so many cool things. Now this here is the blacksmith shop and we've learned at many places before that the blacksmith was one of the most important people in the farming area. They could not only shoe the horses and take care of them, but they also did a lot of the necessary iron work for the wagons and buggies, made tools, created all the things that they needed that required metal. And this was a job that was a pretty difficult, tough job because they constantly were slaving away inside this area that was stoking a fire. So during the summer months, you can only imagine that was pretty hot. Now I do always like to see me a good demonstration from a blacksmith though, because they show you what it took to make something as simple as a knife. It was a process, to say the least, pounding away at a single piece of metal until it was perfect. Same thing with horseshoes, tools, weapons. Everything took time, and this one person was extremely dedicated to their craft to make it happen for everyone, which is much more than just what we think about with horseshoes alone. The blacksmith deserves more street cred, guys. Now this small building right here would have been considered to be the spring house. And notice it has this almost like tube that runs through it. And that's where the water would have moved through to keep it nice and cool in there. A lot of times the spring house was located directly on a source of cool water so that it could be used as a refrigerator for all of the things that couldn't be smoked or preserved. That means that you would be putting a lot of things in here that were necessary for your day to day, despite it being such a small building. Now this one obviously has been brought here because it's not placed on any kind of moving water. But if this were a real spring house, it probably would be located closer to the waterway, which is right over here. And just like that, guys, we've made it back to the original farmhouse. And this is where the family would have stayed. Now, typically, this door right here would probably be open for us to go in and browse. However, again, this isn't one of the things that we can do right now. So we can look on the outside and see what it would have looked like to live in a traditional farmhouse. Much different than the style that we have now, but this is where it all began. Now, if you come out to this particular visitor center in the early morning or in the evening, you can see the elk in this massive field. This is where they bed down and they also come to munch a little bit. So they do recommend that if you do see an elk to keep your distance as always. And they also tell you to not use the field for walking across when the elk are there for your safety and for theirs, of course. So 
all in all, this is a really cool stop off just right inside the park. Literally the first stop that you will find. And I definitely recommend stopping off here to check out the visitor center, the grounds, the walking tour. If you've enjoyed today's video, make sure that you leave a thumbs up, subscribe, and then also check out future Smoky Mountain travels and adventures. I think that you're really gonna like this tour that we're going on. I'm gonna be sharing lots of outdoor spaces and interior spaces, things that you will like and I definitely recommend you come along for the ride. Bye guys.